Number 1. On March 25, 1975, sisters Catherine Lyon, 10, and Sheila Lyon, 12, left their home in Kensington, Maryland, and headed to Wheaton Plaza. It was the first day of their spring break, and the two girls wanted to have a little fun with their friends. The shopping mall was only a short distance from their home, and the girls went there to grab lunch with friends and look at Easter decorations and exhibits via Charlie Project. During that time, it was common for children as young as the Lion Sisters to go to places unsupervised by an adult. They lived in a safe community where serious crimes rarely happened. The girls were expected to be home at 4 p.m. for their curfew, but they never showed. By 7 p.m., Catherine and Sheila still weren't home, and that was when their parents, John and Mary Lyon, called authorities to report them missing. Authorities immediately started an investigation and looked for Catherine and Sheila Lyon. According to the Charlie Project, a few witnesses came forward and said they saw the two girls. Catherine and Sheila's 15-year-old brother saw them at the Orange Bowl restaurant having a meal at approximately 2 p.m. on the afternoon of their disappearance. A friend of the sisters saw them walking along Drum Avenue, the road leading back to their home, at about 2.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Investigators searched for clues and the Lion sisters' whereabouts, but they weren't able to find anything. The community also came together to search for the missing children, but they were unsuccessful. The neighborhood was no longer a safe place and parents were worried about the safety of their own kids. The tragic disappearance of these two young women is every parent's worst nightmare and completely shifted the dynamics of parenting back in 1975. Henry Schlieff of Investigation Discovery said, per Den of Geek, residents feared that someone in their community was responsible for abducting the girls, and they put a tighter leash on their children. Investigators interviewed several people who had something to say about Catherine and Sheila Lyon's case. Per the Cinemaholic, one girl who was at the mall on the day the girls disappeared, said the witness the Lion sisters confronting a man who was staring at them. She described him as having long hair with a pock-marked face and a scar on his cheek, and she estimated his age to be late teens to early twenties. A sketch of the description was made, but it wasn't released to the public. There was another young man who claimed to have seen Catherine and Sheila talking to an old man outside the Orange Bowl. He said the man wore a suit and carried a briefcase with a tape recorder. Sketches were also made of the man and it was released to the public. Several people claimed that they saw the man at the mall that day. Despite the witness statements, however, there were no further leads that pointed to what happened to the Lion sisters, and the case went cold over the years. In 2013, detectives reopened the cold case of Catherine and Sheila Lyon. As reported by Bethesda magazine, they poured over case files that included interviews witness statements, and sketches of the possible suspects. They focused on a man named Lloyd Lee Welch, who gave a statement to the authorities back in 1975, when he was just 18 years old. In his interview, Welch stated that he witnessed the Lion sisters' abduction and provided an overly detailed account of what happened. Back then, authorities didn't focus on Welch, as they assumed that he approached the police with a false statement in order to collect the reward money. Per the Washington Post, detectives who were working on the cold case noticed that Welch had a resemblance to one of the composite sketches of the possible abductor back in the 70s. They looked further into his whereabouts and they discovered that he was serving time in prison for molesting a minor. Detectives visited Welch in prison to see whether they could find a link between him and Catherine and Sheila's case. Upon meeting Lloyd Lee Welch at the penitentiary where he was locked up, Detectives were surprised by what the inmate said. I know why you're here. You're here about those two missing kids, he stated, according to the Washington Post. In 1975, Welch worked for a carnival company that traveled to different locations in the United States. But it was confirmed that he was in Maryland at the time of Catherine and Sheila Lyon's disappearance. Detectives also named Lloyd's uncle, Richard Welch, as a person of interest, and they believe that he worked as a security guard in Wheaton in the 70s, per NBC Washington. During an interview with Welch, he revealed that he left Wheaton Plaza with the Lion sisters, but denied doing anything to them. He claimed that he brought the girls to his uncle's property in Bedford County, Virginia, 
and he never saw the girls again. Welch claimed that his father and uncle sexually assaulted the girls and killed them before burning their bodies. Detectives have no way of confirming Welch's claims, as his father had already died, and there was no evidence found to charge his uncle. In 2015, Welch was charged with first-degree felony murder for the deaths of Catherine and Sheila. Although Lloyd Lee Welch claimed that he wasn't responsible for the murders of Catherine and Sheila Lyon, he admitted to abducting them, and he was charged with abduction with intent to defile. Welch entered a guilty plea in court, and he was sentenced to 48 years in prison as reported by the Washington Post. Although the Lions don't have all the details about what happened to Catherine and Sheila, the conviction of Welch brings some sort of conclusion to their decades-long ordeal. In a statement, the girl's father, John Lyon, said, the last two or three years or so they have treated Sheila and Kate as if they were their own sisters or daughters. It's been a long time. We're tired and we just want to go home. Welch is also serving time for sexual assault cases not related to the Lion sisters, and he will most likely spend the remainder of his life in prison. Number 2. When 17-year-old Melanie Rode left a local nightclub at 2 a.m., her boyfriend offered to pay for a taxi but she refused, cheerfully opting to take the 30-minute walk home. It was a route the bright, popular teenager from Bath had taken numerous times before, but on June 9, 1984, she didn't make it. Melanie who was about to take her A-levels and was looking forward to going to university, was stabbed 26 times and raped by a sadistic killer who left her to die in a pool of blood just yards from her front door. Her body was found at 5.30 a.m. by the 11-year-old son of a milkman, helping his dad on his early morning round. The killer had left a trail of blood spots from the scene of the crime and semen on the body, but it would be 32 years before DNA advances, and a lucky break led to the arrest of Christopher Hampton who was jailed for life in 2016. The murder which features in tonight's episode of Murder Town on Crime Plus Investigation sent shockwaves through the picturesque Somerset City and had a devastating effect on Melanie's family. In her impact statement, read out at Hampton's trial, Melanie's mother, then 81, described how the family was torn apart by the brutal death and haunted by thoughts of her finals moments. We put on a face for the outside world, she said. Once asleep I hoped I would never wake up so that I could be with Melanie and comfort her. The thought of what our lovely daughter had to endure on that fateful night still sucks the energy from within me. The horror of the way our daughter died hangs over us like a heavy lead weight which never moves away. The city's horror was compounded when another young woman, Melanie Hall, disappeared after a night out on exactly the same date, June 9, 12 years later. Her skull and bones were discovered in a bin bag by a workman in 2009 and her killer has never been found due to lack of forensic evidence. In an exclusive interview with The Sun, investigating officer Gary Mason says police have not ruled out Hampton as a suspect. He believes Hampton must have committed other offenses before Melanie's murder. He wasn't on police records at all, not even for assault or a minor offense he says. But most police officers and criminal psychologists would say you don't go from nothing to a crime like that. That doesn't mean it never happens, but I find it hard to believe Melanie Rhodes' murder is his only crime. All hell let loose a police loudhailer split the piece of the residential area of Lansdon at 9.15 on the morning of June 9, 1984 repeatedly calling out the name Melanie. Having found the unidentified body of a young woman lying in the street, officers had discovered a key ring bearing only her first name, and were now looking for the family of the tragic victim. Jean Rode, already frantic with worry after finding her daughter's bed had not been slept in, ran out and banged on the boot of the passing police car, demanding an explanation. The horrifying truth was about to hit home. The police officer escorted me back to the house. And that's when all hell let loose as our lives were taken over by the tragedy and horror. When hearing of our daughter's death, she said. After raping her, Melanie's killer had partially dressed her before leaving her to die in front of garages in a quiet cul-de-sac. She had some deep stab wounds, mainly in the front 
and some more shallow stab wounds to her back recalls Gary Mason. The officers attending the scene read that she was probably prodded with a knife to make her go in a direction that the offender wanted her to. A pool of blood was found behind a low wall a few yards from where her body had been found, prompting speculation she had crouched behind it hiding from her attacker, before being dragged out. A trail of 86 blood spots led from the body back towards the city center, stretching half a mile, and police swabbed every spot, as well as recovering semen from the body. But forensics were unable to analyze DNA in 1984 and could only narrow suspects down through matching blood types. A huge manhunt followed, with 90,000 with the correct blood type being interviewed, but police initially drew a blank. In her statement, Jean said the family's world fell apart. Big brother Adrian was unable to complete his university exams, and sister Karen, who was breastfeeding her youngest child, was so distressed her milk dried up. We sat for hours traumatized by the horror of knowing Melanie was gone forever, she wrote. To never see her beautiful smile and girlish laughter hurts beyond repair. Jean told how she would wander aimlessly through the city streets hoping to see a glimpse of Melanie, adding, where Melanie's blood was spilled, I prayed that it would not rain to wash it away, and when it did, I cursed the rain for finally taking it away. Advances in DNA technology in 1995 meant that if the perpetrator was on the police database, he would be identified, as would any suspect swab during investigation, but still the killer remained a mystery. Then on June 9, 1996, 25-year-old Melanie Hall had a row with her boyfriend in a bath nightclub before he stormed off. Later that night, Melanie disappeared. The chilling coincidence of both the date and the name led many in Bath to believe the two murders were linked. It would be 13 years before a workman clearing a slip road on the M5 would find a bin liner containing the bones and skull of a young woman who was later identified as Ms. Hall. In a press conference at the time her heartbroken father Steve said, We had a young, vibrant daughter, happy, with a future in front of her. Today we have a bag of bones discarded on the side of a motorway. Mum Patricia said she was glad they could now bury her properly, but expressed her anger that Melanie had been dumped on the side of a road like a sack of garbage. The development of familial DNA testing which meant a suspect could be identified through a match with a close relative, provided new hope of a breakthrough. In 2014, Detective Chief Inspector Julie McKay pushed for a new manhunt, using the pioneering forensic method and an incredible twist of fate provided them with a chief suspect. Christopher Hampton's daughter arrested for a minor domestic offense for which she received a caution, provided a DNA sample, which suggested she was related to Melanie Rhodes' killer. Gary Mason was sent to swab her father, a painter and decorator, who surprisingly agreed. I'd been in the police for 40 years, and I've dealt with all sorts of criminals for murder, for serious sexual assaults, and looking back, I am still amazed I couldn't pick up on any sense of anxiousness or a feeling of guilt, he says. He shook my hand when I greeted him. He sat down. He signed the consent forms and agreed to two swabs. He knew that they were going to prove his guilt and that within about five weeks, we would know he was the offender. But he was as calm as anything. In fact, Gary reveals, a delay in the operation also worked in their favor. Julie McKay was trying to get the management team to agree and get the paperwork to get pushed through to get it done. But it got delayed, he says. If it had happened when we asked for it to happen, we would have been before his daughter's arrest. And we'd have missed it by about a month or two. It was lucky. But you make your own luck to some degree. Hampton initially entered a plea of not guilty. But when faced with DNA evidence, he changed his plea, and in May, 2016, was jailed for life. But he has never cooperated with the police, and Gary says we may never find out if he killed others, including Melanie Hall. Another potential victim could be Shelley Morgan, a 33-year-old mum who was stabbed to death and sexually assaulted in Bristol two days after Melanie Rowe died. An eminent criminal psychologist, felt there was a lot of similarities with the Shelley Morgan murder, and that remains undetected but, as with Melanie Hall, there is very little forensic potential, he says. He has always refused to speak to us, even about the murder he has been convicted of, and there are still so many questions. But I believe he may have committed other crimes, especially when you consider that, on that night, he was out and about in the early hours, and he had a knife with him. So he was obviously up to no good.
Obviously if we had DNA that could prove Christopher Hampton was responsible for other offenses, I would be pleased for the sake of the families, but cold cases are never, ever forgotten, and will always be pursued where possible. For Melanie Rhodes' family, the 32-year wait added to their immense pain, splitting the family, and, they believe, contributing to Tony's early dementia, but Gary is pleased they finally got the closure they deserved. The family were so pleased when we got the offender, and they all wanted to go to the court and say their piece, he says. So, for them, I feel we achieved an awful lot because we never gave up, and we didn't forget, at any stage, what Melanie had been through. Number 3. When Gregory Keith Davies, 74, finally confessed that he was an opportunistic child killer, he did so not because of one shred of remorse, but because he knew he had been trapped by a combination of new age science and old-fashioned policing. For decades, the quiet everyman must have been confident that he would take his secret to the grave. On Melbourne Cup Day 1984, Davies saw a little girl called Killy Mayberry heading to her home in Gregory Grove, Preston, after buying some sugar for her mother from a food plus convenience store. At 5.30 p.m. the streets were relatively quiet, and Davies, then 42, would have thought no one would have seen him take the six-year-old. But he was wrong, when she didn't return, Killy's mother, Julie, and a neighbor went looking. A woman approached the neighbor to say a girl matching Killy's description had been driven away in a white Holden station wagon which was a match for Davies' car. It was a chance meeting Davies lived locally and had just happened upon Killy as she was heading home with the sugar in her bag. Back in those days, DNA testing had not been invented, which meant the offender could not know that a semen sample left on his victim would mean the case would always remain open. Not only did DNA ultimately lead police to the killer, it cleared another one who was perilously close to being charged. Seven years after Killy's murder there was a remarkably similar crime against another six-year-old, Sherry Beasley, who was abducted on June 29, 1991, near her Rosebud home. Her body was found in a drain on September 26 in Red Hill. The killer was Robert Arthur Selby Lowe, and he became the prime suspect in the Mayberry case. Shortly before Killy Mayberry was murdered, Police interviewed Lowe over offensive behavior involving three young girls in Preston, only a kilometer from where Killy would later be kidnapped. He was a traveling salesman whose work often took him to the area. He had made sexual suggestions to the girls, and a neighbor took the registration number of his car. Police did not prosecute him because of lack of corroboration. There were many similarities between the cases. The girls were the same age and were abducted while on errands for their mothers on a day when Lowe was not working. Lowe was also fascinated by pink. Killy carried a pink strawberry shortcake bag, and Sherry was dressed in pink. The bag was later recovered near Ferntree Gully Road. Lowe lived off the same main road. In 1995 experts found there was enough DNA material on the clothing to identify the killer. Lowe resisted through the courts any attempt to force him to provide a sample. This strengthened police views that he was the killer. But when they finally got the sample he was cleared. Science showed he was the wrong man. Some police say that if DNA hadn't cleared him, there may have been sufficient circumstantial evidence to charge him. Two relatives of Killy her grandfather, John Moss and uncle, Mark Mayberry, committed suicide in separate incidents after the murder. Mr. Moss died in October 1985, less than 12 months after Killy's body was discovered and after rumors linked him to her death. Homicide investigations cleared him of any involvement. Mark Mayberry hanged himself in his cell at Pentridge Prison in February 1987. The charges against him were unrelated. Eventually homicide cold case detectives launched an investigation into the Mayberry case and decided to check every possible suspect. Davies had been spoken to by police two days after Killy's body was found. He told them he had been at a barbecue on Cup Day and returned home in his white Holden station wagon, about the same time Killy went to the shop, but that he spent the night at home alone, as his mother and sister stayed with a relative. Three decades on, the fact that Davies was a neighbor and had a car that matched one scene near the Food Plus was hardly enough, but he had been nominated by a family member as the possible killer 
and then had been convicted of a sex crime years after the Mayberry murder. This made him a person of interest in the new investigation. In 2016 he was approached for a DNA sample. It proved positive to the one in the Mayberry case. The science showed the odds of it being anyone other than Davies was 100 billion to 1. Faced with the maths Davies had no choice but to plead guilty. He may now ask a judge to show him mercy because of his age, the sort of compassion he failed to show a little girl just going home on a family errand. Number 4. On October 22, 1989, 11-year-old Jacob Wetterling rode his bike to a local video store in St. Joseph, Minnesota. He had no idea that it would be the last cheerful experience he ever had. On his way back home, Wetterling was abducted and never seen alive again. Wetterling's best friend and younger brother were there, too. But they fled when the masked perpetrator ordered them to run away at gunpoint. According to ABC News, local police teamed up with the FBI, as they believed Wetterling's disappearance was connected to a slew of recent cases in the region involving child sexual assault that had yet to be solved. The FBI was confident that these incidents weren't random. Armed with a list of suspects, they questioned a local man named Danny Heinrich within months of Wetterling's disappearance. While they took samples of his DNA, testing methods weren't standardized yet. It was only in 2015 that the disturbing truth came to light. Renewed investigations matched Heinrich's DNA to the sexual assault of another boy mere miles from Wetterling's last known location. While the statute of limitations for that crime had long expired, police were granted a search warrant for Heinrich's home and found macabre answers to Wetterling's disappearance. Born on February 17, 1978, in Long Prairie, Minnesota, Jacob Irwin Wetterling had a beautiful childhood before his charmed young life was extinguished forever. Raised by Jerry and Patty Wetterling, he and his younger brother Trevor had free reign to roam the great outdoors and ride their bikes like most kids of their generation. On October 22, 1989, however, Patty Wetterling wanted her children to stay home, she told CNN. She and her husband were at a dinner party when Jacob called her at 9 p.m. to ask if they could ride to the video store. Since it was already dark outside and the boys would have to leave their little sister, Carmen, alone to do so, she said no. The resourceful kids then called Jacob's father, Jerry, to try once more. They assured him they would wear reflective vests and use flashlights on the mile-long bike ride to the store. As for Carmen, they would get their 14-year-old neighbor to babysit. Jerry agreed. So the Wetterling brothers and their friend Aaron set off after renting the Naked Gun, 1988. On VHS, the trio mounted their bicycles and pedaled back. They hadn't gone far when a masked man emerged from a driveway and ordered the boys to abandon their bikes in a ditch and lie face down on the asphalt. He then asked them their ages. Wetterling's 10-year-old brother Trevor was told to run into the woods and not look back, or he'd be shot. The man then told Jacob and Aaron to turn around so he could inspect their faces, before ordering 11-year-old Aaron to leave as well. Trevor and Aaron rushed home to notify the neighbors, but it was the last time anyone saw Wetterling alive. The neighbors immediately notified Wetterling's parents and the police. Officers responded to the abduction site within six minutes and began searching for Wetterling both from the ground and by helicopter. Disturbingly, they didn't find a single sign of life, despite the optimism of Stearns County Sheriff John Sanner. Everybody thought that within a few hours we would get it taken care of he recalled. By the time Patty Wetterling granted an interview to Minnesota's Pioneer Press two months later, the FBI and National Guard adjoined the search. Residents founded the Friends of Jacob Wetterling Center and received 1,000 applications to help send out flyers to raise awareness. Donations to the center went toward an increasingly lucrative reward, and police received thousands of tips. The FBI questioned Heinrich on December 16, 1989, but released him without charges after taking a DNA sample. Decades passed with no arrests for the crime until amateur sleuth Joy Baker got involved. Baker was 22 years old when Wetterling went missing, and she wrote her first blog post about the case in 2010. She became personally invested in the matter after seeing Wetterling's heartbroken parents on television 
so she started investigating. It didn't take long for her to center in on the case of Jared Sheerl. Sheerl was 12 years old when he was abducted and molested by a masked man on January 13, 1989. The suspect had threatened him with a gun and told him to run off without looking back or he would be shot, since this had occurred within 10 miles of the location of Wetterling's abduction. Baker believed the cases were linked. Baker's work garnered traction when she and Cheryl were interviewed on CNN's The Hunt in 2014. After renewing their efforts, authorities discovered that the previously unidentified DNA from Cheryl's crime scene was a match to Heinrich's DNA. Unfortunately for Cheryl, the statute of limitations had run out. The police did obtain a search warrant for Heinrich's home in July 2015. However, and arrested him in October 2015 for child pornography found in sight in his house. Facing 25 federal charges, he accepted a plea agreement and confessed to Wetterling's murder. He proved his involvement by leading investigators to the burial site on August 31, 2016. The boy's remains were removed from a pasture about 30 miles from his home and confirmed to be Wetterling's through dental records as reported by NBC News. Heinrich testified to the crime and confessed to handcuffing the child, driving him to a Painesville gravel pit, and molesting him before shooting him and burying him there. While he was sentenced to 20 years for child pornography charges, Heinrich's plea bargain prevented him from being convicted for Wetterling's death. Ultimately, however, the boy's legacy became far grander than his tragic murder, as his parents formed the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center an advocacy group for children's safety. Perhaps most notable of all, the federal Jacob Wetterling Act was passed in 1994. It was the first law in American history to mandate that each state maintain a sex offender registry. As for his parents' foundation, it aims to educate the public about who takes children, how they do it, and what each of us can do to stop it. Number 5. The Florida neighborhood of Wellington was reeling in late May 1990 when Marlene Warren, the wife of a local car dealer, was greeted by the barrel of a gun as she opened the door to her manicured, ranch-style home. Even scarier than the murder was the thought of who did it. An orange-haired, white-faced, red-nosed clown, clown shoots woman at door. A South Florida Sun Sentinel headline from the time reads, The mystery loomed for decades and perpetuated a fear similar to those raised by Stephen King's It, which was released just months later and convicted serial killer John Wayne Gacy. Police hunted for years for enough evidence to lead them to the gunman and obtained enough by 2017 to announce charges against an alleged murderer, who was not a man at all, wearing a red shirt, her hair back and with a sheen on her lips, Sheila Keen Warren. Marlene's husband's second wife stared into the camera for what would become one of the first of many mugshot photos. Wellington, Florida, is known for its many luxe attributes, equestrian athletics and the palm tree-lined streets, to name a few. 32 years ago, it became known for something more sinister, the killer clown murder. Marlene Warren was at her takeoff place home, located within the Aero Club community on the morning of Saturday, May 26, 1990 when she saw a white Chrysler Lebrun approach the home. Marlene, her son and his friends had been eating breakfast at about 10.45 a.m. When they spotted the vehicle roll into the driveway, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office said, a person dressed as a clown wearing a red nose, an orange-haired wig and face paint, exited the sedan and walked to the home's front door, police said. The person dressed as the clown was carrying a flower arrangement and two balloons, the sheriff's office went on. One balloon reportedly bore a picture of Snow White. The other was emblazoned with the words, you're the greatest, and unsuspecting Warren, seeing the offering, responded, oh, how pretty. Before she was met with her tragic fate, the South Florida Sun Sentinel reported, Marlene answered the front door. And as the clown offered the items to her, witnesses heard a gunshot, and Marlene fell to the ground. The person dressed as a clown calmly walked back to the Lebron and drove away, police said. Warren, 40, suffered a gunshot wound to the face and was rushed to a local hospital, where she died two days later. Despite identifying Sheila Keen Warren as a suspect early in the investigation, police progress was slow. 27 years later, investigators had some answers. On Tuesday, September 26, 2017, Sheila Warren was located in Washington County, Virginia, 
and arrested without incident. The Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office announcement from September 26, 2017, was made in a different era of technology that allowed for a press release to be posted on Facebook, a social media site that didn't exist at the time of the murder in question. The announcement detailed how the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office's cold case unit reopened the investigation into Marlene Warren's murder in 2014, when investigators many of whom were presumably not around at the time of the slaying, re-interviewed witnesses and conducted new DNA analyses. Investigators learned Keen Warren, who was married to someone else at the time of the murder, went on to wed Marlene's husband, Michael Warren, in 2002. The pair had been living in Tennessee, where they operated a restaurant, police said. A grand jury voted on August 31, 2017, to charge Keen Warren with Marlene's murder. Police then tracked her to Washington County, Virginia, where they arrested her without incident. She was 54 at the time. The Sun Sentinel described how investigators had accumulated evidence even in the 90s linking Keen Warren to the murders. The evidence reportedly included a witness who positively identified the woman as purchasing balloons and flowers at a store less than a mile from her home and just 90 minutes before Warren's shooting. And costume store employees recognized Keen Warren's picture as possibly being someone who had bought clown garb days before the slaying, the outlet reported. Investigators were allegedly able to link the vehicle use to the car business of Marlene's husband Michael Warren. Investigators said they also found traces of the orange wig when searching Keen Warren's home and in the Chrysler that was abandoned nearby. The report stated, and Keen Warren had reportedly dressed as a clown before at work. Sheila reportedly worked for Michael Warren's car dealership. The Sun Sentinel cited reports in describing how Michael would help Sheila with her rent after she and her husband separated, and the pair would take long lunches. Sheila and Michael lived in a three-bedroom home in Abingdon, Virginia that was adorned with no trespassing signs and was located near South Holston Lake, the Sun Sentinel reported. The Bristol Herald Courier quoted neighbors who called Keen Warren a great person and someone whom they trusted with anything we've got. Her extradition attorney, Wayne Austin, told the Courier she was well-liked and well-respected in the community, according to the Sun Sentinel. Warren was charged with first-degree murder in 2017. Five years later, her trial looms. Keen Warren, now 59, was scheduled to head to trial this Friday with the start of jury selection, records show. Instead, the trial was delayed for the seventh time after the defense received information that they had long been demanding. On October 12, prosecutors revealed that they had located a clown sighting file. Despite their previous claims that they had no such documents, court records show. The 25-page file contains information related to other reports of clown sightings in the area at the time of Warren's slaying, according to the Associated Press. It reportedly includes the names and contact information related for roughly 40 credible clown sighting leads from around the time of Marlene Warren's murder. No new trial date has been set. Defense attorneys previously criticized the prosecution for allegedly failing failing to provide them with information that they would customarily receive ahead of trial. Customarily, a criminal prosecution is straightforward. The police investigate a crime, the police arrest a suspect, and the state prosecutes the suspect, defense attorneys wrote in previous court papers, according to the AP. But the prosecution in this case was not straightforward. They argued, following the arrest, the police and state continued their investigation. They wrote, this backwards prosecution has hampered Ms. Keen Warren's ability to prepare for trial. After the discovery of the clown sighting file, the defense said the new information would take the defense considerable time and resources to investigate. Attorneys on the case are scheduled to meet Friday in response to the defense's efforts to sanction prosecution for their handling of the case, court records show. Defense lawyers are reportedly asking, among other things, for Keen Warren to be released on house arrest pending trial. Number 6. Agawam, Massachusetts, near the western Connecticut border, is a small town, and the people who live there like it that way. In 1989, Agawam voted overwhelmingly not to be known as a city, but to remain simply a town, a place where neighbors are friends, and friends are family. At the Agawam Middle School, under a dogwood tree in the courtyard, there is a memorial to one of the town's most beloved residents, 
24-year-old Lisa Ziegert, whose untimely death changed Agawam forever. Her mother, Dee, described her as a special person who was bubbly, outgoing, and full of fun. She always had a special rapport with children and treated them like people. They knew that she really liked them. Lisa had grown up in Agawam. After college, she returned home to teach special needs students at the middle school. School counselor Dick Coles felt that she was a very gifted teacher who made sure that her students felt valued. Her students recalled that she always helped them with their problems and answered their questions, and that she was always nice to them. On Wednesday, April 15, 1992, Lisa left school around 4.30 p.m. She drove directly to Brittany's card and gift shop, where she worked weekdays from 5 to 9 p.m. At 5.30 p.m., her sister, Lynn, stopped by. Lisa was working on a sketch for their friend. Lynn recalled that their conversation was normal and that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. She left at around 6 p.m. The next morning at 8.45 a.m., Sophia Maynard arrived as usual to open up the store. She was surprised to find Lisa's car in the parking lot, as it was a school day. The lights were on in the store, and the open flag was out. Sophia thought it was strange, and she could not understand why Lisa was there. Then, she remembered that Easter weekend was coming up, and that they had planned to blow up balloons. She figured that that was why Lisa was there. Sophia did not think much of anything until she walked inside the store. She called Lisa's name several times, but received no reply. She came behind the counter and found that all of Lisa's belongings, including her drawings, pocketbook, and car keys, were still there. She knew something was wrong. So she went to a restaurant across the street and had them call the police. Police found signs of a struggle in the back storeroom. Several boxes had been smashed, a few traces of blood were found on those boxes, and on some greeting cards outside of the room. Otherwise, there was no physical evidence at the store. That day, the Agawam Police Department, aided by the FBI and the Massachusetts State Police, launched a massive search. Lisa's family hoped for the best and feared for the worst. Sadly, on the afternoon of Easter Sunday, April 19, four days after Lisa disappeared, her partially clothed body was found in a wooded area off Route 75 on the edge of town. The location was about three miles from the store. She had multiple knife wounds around her shoulders and throat. Although several pieces of evidence were found at the scene, the murder weapon was not located. An examination by the county medical examiner later indicated that she had been sexually assaulted. Never before in the history of Agawam had there been such an outpouring of love, such shared grief. At Lisa's wake, more than 1,000 people stood for five hours in a spring rain to pay her tribute. Her family was happy to see so many people come because it showed what kind of person she was and how much of an impact she had. One of her students recalled how she was a friend to everyone. They wished that there were more people in the world that were like her. As Agawam mourned, the authorities pressed their investigation. Three critical phone tips came in which helped establish a time frame. The first call was from a person who had been in the store at 8.20 p.m. They had made a purchase and actually had a time-stamped receipt. They did not notice anything unusual in the store or about Lisa's demeanor. The second person was a customer of the store who had gone in at 9 p.m. She found it open with the lights on, but nobody was around. She did hear some noise in the back room. She described it as a banging noise. She waited for a minute and when nobody came out, she left. This suggested to police that Lisa was in the store at around 9 p.m. and in the back room. Further investigation revealed that she had been laying horizontal on the floor. There were two kick marks from her shoes on the bottom of the door. The third tip came from a woman who worked near the store. At 9.15 p.m. that night, the woman was on her way home. She stopped at the stop sign at the intersection of Route 75 and Adam Street. While stopped there, she observed a full-size Bronco or Blazer-type vehicle pull off the road into a piece of property that led into the area where Lisa's body was later found. She said that there was an operator in the front and in the back seat. She believed there was two people one male and female. She saw the female's head go up and down a couple of times as the vehicle drove off into the woods. At the time, the woman thought it was just a carload of teenagers she drove on. There have been no further clues. Today, the students of Agawam Middle School cherish the memorial they established in honor of Lisa, who, in her own brief life, touched so many of their lives. Dee believes that Lisa's death caused many of her students to realize that life isn't always fair 
and that they have to be extra careful, and that sometimes, even if they're extra careful, it doesn't matter. She believes that Lisa's murderers have to be punished so that the students know that there is justice in the world, suspects. The car described by the third woman was a late model, full-sized Bronco or Blazer, and was either dark red or dark blue. It has never been found. Police took plaster molds of tire tracks left at the murder scene. They were identified as Cooper tires. The combination of tires on the vehicle were so distinctive, detectives were able to comb through sales records of local dealerships and track down the driver of the vehicle. However, it turned out that he was at the scene with friends several days before the murder. He was ruled out. An unidentified man reportedly watched Lisa and other members of the Healthy Habits Fitness Center while they worked out. This happened shortly before her murder. Witnesses noted that he watched her closely in a perverted fashion. The man was described as Caucasian in his 30s in 1992, 5'10", with a beer belly and wavy light brown hair. At the time, he wore work clothes and drove a red sports car. It is not known if he has any connection to the case. In the weeks prior to Lisa's abduction, she told people that she believed that she was being watched. She also asked several friends and relatives to visit her frequently at the store as she did not like being there alone. This led investigators to believe that her killer had been stalking her in the weeks up to her murder. Lisa's boyfriend's roommate, Edward Borgatti Jr., was questioned regarding her murder. He is also the son of an Agawam police officer. He was working at a restaurant across the street from the store when she vanished. However, it is not known if he was ever considered a suspect in this case. In December 2015, DNA found at the crime scene was sent to Parabone Nanolabs, a DNA forensic analysis service. The company then created a composite, seen to the right, using DNA phenotyping. Based on their analysis, they determined that Lisa's killer was likely fair-skinned with hazel or brown eyes and brown or black hair. In 2017, investigators looked into 11 suspects who had refused to give a DNA sample over the years. One was 48-year-old Agawam resident Gary Edward Shara, at the time of the murder. He was married with a young son. He had no known criminal record. However, he had been a suspect since 1993, after his ex-wife, now deceased, told her attorney that she believed he was involved in Lisa's murder. He came home late that night and did not tell her where he was. He also had cuts on his hands. She noticed that he seemed preoccupied with the case whenever it was mentioned on television. She also had reportedly found some disturbing writings in his diary that led her to believe he was responsible. She later fled with their son and hid with relatives because she was afraid of him. Unfortunately, because she was an alcoholic, her tip was not taken seriously at the time. In September, a state trooper went to Shara's apartment with a court order, ordering him to provide a DNA sample. He was not home at the time, but his roommate was there. The trooper gave the roommate a business card and told him to have Shara contact him. When his roommate told him about the visit, Shara wrote three documents and left them at his girlfriend's house. A confession to Lisa's murder, a last will and testament, and a brief apology letter to her family. He then fled the area. Later that day, Shara's girlfriend found the letters and handed them to the police. He was later found in a Connecticut hospital after he attempted suicide. His DNA was then matched to the evidence at the crime scene. On September 16, he was arrested at the hospital and charged with murder aggravated rape and kidnapping. On September 25, 2019, Shara unexpectedly pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in this case. The rape and kidnapping charges were dropped as a result. He admitted in court to being responsible for her death. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In his confessions, he stated that he had been fascinated with abduction and bondage from an early age. On the day of the murder, he let himself do something terrible. He claimed that he had not intended on killing her when he abducted her, but events spun out of his control. Although he never mentioned it in his confession, police believe that he became obsessed with Lisa after he bought a music box from the store. He later gave the box to his then-wife. Number 7. 
More than four decades after the ex-wife of Righteous Brothers singer Bill Medley was raped and killed, officials announced Monday they used DNA to identify a suspect in the slaying, a man who was killed by police in 1982. Los Angeles County Sheriff Jim McDonald said investigators believe Kenneth Eugene Troyer was responsible for the January 1976 slaying of Karen Claus. The 32-year-old was attacked January 30, 1976 as she returned to her home in the Hermosa Beach neighborhood, was sexually assaulted and strangled with her pantyhose. She never regained consciousness and died a few days later at the hospital. Investigators used a controversial DNA testing technique, known as familial DNA, to compare a sample of DNA that was collected at the crime scene and were able to identify a first-degree relative of Troyer. Sheriff's Captain Steve Katz said, officials would not identify the relative and would only say the sample they used was an estate database of convicted felons. The technique, which has raised ethical issues in the forensics community, allows investigators to search law enforcement databases to identify likely relatives of the person who may have committed the crime. Law enforcement officials have argued the technique can provide investigators with valuable leads but because of the familial DNA search, detect were able to link Troyer's DNA and positively confirm his identity as the killer, McDonald said Monday, as he stood alongside Medley and more than a dozen other law enforcement officials. Familial DNA search is the only reason Troyer was identified in this horrific crime. Troyer, who had been suspected of committing several other sexual assaults in California, was shot and killed by police after escaping from a California prison in 1982, McDonald said. As investigators began to hone in on him as a possible suspect last year, they were able to obtain a sample of his DNA that was held in the Orange County Coroner's office and conclusively link him to Claus Slaying, Katz said. The arrest brought closure to a family that has struggled with questions for decades. Medley told reporters at a news conference Monday, it's been something we've been hoping for and speculating about for 40 years, and all of a sudden they say, we got him, and here's who did it Medley said, it's just nice to be able to close the book on this. Number 8. A 25-year-old cold case was solved after familial DNA testing provided investigators with key information that solved the rape and murder of an 84-year-old woman in her San Diego home, authorities announced Friday. Angela Kleinserge died from multiple stab wounds to the neck. At the time of the crime in February 1992, regular DNA testing did not match any individuals in a statewide offender database. District Attorney Bonnie Duminas said. Last July, the case was submitted by the San Diego Police Department and District Attorney's Office to the Department of Justice with a request for familial DNA testing. Familial DNA searches allow investigators to search offender databases with wider parameters, identifying people who are likely to be close relatives of the person who may have committed a crime. The familial DNA results from Kleinserge's murder matched a convicted offender who was deceased. However, the familial DNA typing results showed there was a high likelihood that Kleinserge's murderer was a brother of that deceased convict. It was determined through further investigation there was one living brother and another brother, who was killed in a 2006 motorcycle crash in San Diego County. San Diego police investigators were able to obtain DNA samples from the living brother, and he was eliminated as a suspect. San Diego police lab criminalist Adam Dutra received tissue samples from the medical examiner from the other brother, Jeffrey Falls, who was killed in the motorcycle crash at age 42. The crime lab was able to obtain a partial DNA profile from the deceased suspect's tissue that matched the crime scene sample pointing to Falls as the killer. The likelihood ratio of kinship between the crime scene sample and Falls is in the quadrillions, further evidence that investigators had solved the case. The results of this testing has brought a measure of closure to the victim's family. More than two decades after her murder Duminus said, while familial DNA testing remains fairly rare in the U.S., this is an excellent example of how law enforcement can use science as a way to propel an investigation forward and solve more crimes. Angela Kleinserge's daughter, Hedy, said the case being solved means Mr. Falls no longer thinks he got away with my mom's rape and murder. Hedy Kleinserge said Falls lived across the street from their family home. California has solved several cases using familial searching, 
including the so-called Grim Sleeper case in Los Angeles. A serial killer preyed on vulnerable women and eluded identification for decades until investigators matched crime scene DNA to the killer's son, whose DNA was in an offender database. Number 9. The family of the man whose murder was a mystery for 43 years in Jacksonville is now speaking only to her after a recent break in the case that led to an arrest. In 1974, 34-year-old Freddie Farah was gunned down during a robbery attempt at the Grand Park grocery store he owned. Freddie's son, Bobby Farah, was just six years old at the time, but he has spent his adult years pushing for police to find justice for his dad. That tenacity did pay off with an arrest finally made last month. You're in our hearts and prayers every day. Bobby said at his father's grave, standing by his mother Nadia, he was the love of my life, the father of my four children, said Nadia. He was just the sweetest guy you ever met. It's a bittersweet time for them as they do have relief and knowing someone's finally been arrested. But that doesn't dull the pain of losing a loving husband and an affectionate father. All these years later, Nadia remembers getting the call no young wife can ever imagine receiving. When we got the phone call, they told us he was shot in the hand, and that he was in the ER at what was then Methodist Hospital. So, I went racing over there and I was met by relatives at the door, and I could tell by the look on their face that it wasn't just a shot in the hand and that he had passed away, Nadia said. Freddie was shot in the head and over the years, his murder case went cold. Nadia was left with four kids, all under the age of 11, and because she was busy, she didn't follow up with police. But as her son Bobby grew, he wanted answers to his questions, and he convinced a detective to reopen his father's case in 1998. It just bothered me that I didn't know who or why, Bobby said. And I told her, until they tell me to stop asking and quit coming around, that I would continue to ask. After 7, 8, 10 years, I would tell him, Honey if they have not found him now, they are never going to find him. Whether he's dead or he just disappeared Nadia recalled telling Bobby. But Bobby didn't quit, and over the years, DNA technology evolved. After several dead ends, police got a DNA match on a palm print from the crime scene. A print police say belongs to Joni Lewis Miller, a street performer known as Uncle Louis, popular for his Uncle Sam mime routine in New Orleans's French Quarter. The Farah family was summoned to the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office last month to talk with detectives. He looked at my mom and said, we've made an arrest in your husband's murder. And it was overwhelming, Bobby recalled. I was in shock, added Nadia, because I was expecting them to say, I'm sorry. We did our best, but we couldn't find him. But when he told me that, I was in shock. I didn't know what to say. But then I was relieved. After all of his efforts, it paid off. Crime doesn't just affect the immediate family. It also affects generations. You have grandchildren. You have eight grandchildren. Hopefully, you get to see them from heaven. Nadia said to her late husband by his grave. Bobby says he's not mad that he was robbed of the experience of having a father but describes the feeling he has more like frustration. He missed out on so many things, and I often wonder where exactly I would be in my life, and my children's life, and my sister's lives, had he been here, explained Bobby. Every time a big event occurs in our life, I would think, what would Freddie say if he saw this? Would he be proud? Nadia added. The Ferris know that just because there's been an arrest, it doesn't mean there will be a conviction in the case. They are preparing themselves for that possibility, but truly feel if Joni Lewis Miller wasn't the right person, the evidence wouldn't have led police to him. Miller has an extradition hearing scheduled for June 26 in Louisiana.